our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people. We urgently need financial, political and social innovations that enable us to overcome this structural dependency on growth. We need to change the system. This isn't cleaning up the beaches in the case of plastic a little bit faster. That's vital, that has to be done. But you need to stem the flow. Gosimon explores sustainable change and the women inspiring it. Who are they? What made them who they are? How do they read the world they live in? Our guests share their story, roots, passions and hopes for the future. They tell us more about the alternatives and strategies they developed to tackle climate change. Our Simon today is Stacy Levy. Stacy is an American eco-artist. She's a sculptor making large-scale public installations in rivers, streets, parking lots, airports and nature centers. She merges the principle of art, ecology, science and collaborative engagement. A latest completed art piece is called Collected Watershed. It's a live map made of 8,000 recycled jars filled with water collected from every tributary in and around the University of Towson. With Stacy, we talked about making art outside Algaris, links between art, science and ecology, the importance of rain, working with communities, activism, sacrifice, the dilemma of art financed by unethical companies' philanthropy and American politics. This interview was recorded remotely, Stacy being based in Pennsylvania, United States. Hi, Stacy. Hey, how are you? Thank you, Stacy, for joining us at Go Simon and accepting this interview about your work. Excellent. I'm really looking forward to this. It's a great opportunity, and thanks for finding me. To start, I'd like to talk a little bit about your roots and where you grew up and what kind of childhood you had. It's very interesting. You rarely get asked about your childhood, but it had a huge impact on my life. I grew up in Philadelphia, but Philadelphia, though it has many things problematic with it, it has a couple of really wonderful things. And one of them is the world's largest urban park called Fairmount Park. And I grew up right on the border of the park. So I could sort of roll out of bed, cross my lawn and be in the park within minutes. And I spent a lot of time playing in the woods, in the forest. And it was a tremendous and mysterious place to be. And there also were a lot of streams running through it. And I spent a lot of time playing in streams and damming them up and sailing sticks down the streams. It was really great to be so deep into nature. How were your parents talking to you? What kind of relationships did you have with them? Well, my parents were great. They really sort of let me, I guess I was one of the early free range children because I could say, and I remember <laughs> saying this to my mother, I'll be back when I'm back. And I would step out of the house and come back, usually before dark because, or during dusk because it got hard to navigate. But I could go out and do whatever I wanted to outside. So in the summer, I pretty much lived outside and come in for things to eat and drink. But otherwise, I was very free to wander around and, and mostly to hang out in nature for really long periods of time, climb up a tree and sit on a branch and and just be there, sort of make a outdoor room out of nature. And that was really great. How did you end up studying art? I didn't really want to study art because there are a lot of artists in my family. I really wanted to be a scientist. And like almost anyone who's interested in nature, the first thing you always want to be is a marine biologist so that you could, I wanted to study <laughs> seals but we're very compelled by the mammals, sea mammals, because I guess if you like swimming, you totally understand a seal or a porpoise or a dolphin. And whales were very much of the thing at that moment. So that's what I wanted to do. But I also just found myself very happy when I was making things with my hands. And I tried a great deal of my life to get away from being an artist, but it kept coming back around to haunt me. Were your parents encouraging you in that path? My mother was extremely encouraging. She was great because she always said, you should do what makes you happy. I can't say that art exactly made me happy, but it, may, it felt like that's what I was meant to do. I think my father really wanted me to be a lawyer, 
And sometimes I worry that I could have been more effective environmentally if I was a lawyer, but I would have been extremely unhappy as a lawyer. And one of the things I mm-hmm. used to do is I would work in his office back before computers and, and laws being digitized. You would have to, as the laws changed, you would tear these tiny onion skin sheets, or they're not tiny, they were thin onion skin sheets of paper out of these law books and put in new ones when there was a slight nuance change to the law. And I'm sure it's all those hours spent doing the most tedious work in the world that made me never want to be a lawyer. Sculpture is your main mode of expression artistically. Why having chosen that? And did you explore other modes of expression? Probably if I had had better math skills, I might have been an architect. So space was always Mm. really interesting to me. And I got into sculpture because I loved art, but I couldn't really get into the flat plane of painting because I really wanted to be out in space making something about the space. And so the most logical answer was, if you're not going to be an architect, the next thing would be to be a sculptor. But I slowly went farther and farther from the idea of object and more and more to the idea of being a verb that was doing something in space. So that was a a long path of my development as an artist, was getting away from what I always referred to as dust-collecting objects of art and trying to work more with the space in between, which works much better if you're going to deal with an entire forest or a watershed because you could never make enough objects And it would be absurd to fill up the space with objects. So you really need to talk about the in-between when you're working with ecology. And so I've tried to be both a sculptor, but what I work with is not always a thing, but it's the space between the things. Has it always been obvious to you that you wanted to work in collaboration with nature? It wasn't really a thing. When I was growing up in the 60s and then sort of being a teenager in the 70s, There was a little bit of art that happened outside of the gallery, but mostly you had to go into a museum to see art, unless it was a a man Mm. on a horse, a monument that was outside. And Philadelphia does have an excellent public art collection. There were a lot of statues outside. And actually, my grandmother was a sculptor and did art that went outside, basically did public art. But I I didn't really recognize it at the time. But as I was looking into what was being made, I was studying the land artists of the 70s. And I was very interested, particularly in Nancy Holt. And I was really interested in Lucy Lepard's book called Overlay, which is about the earth art. But there was some aspect of the male earth art that really left a bad taste in my mouth. And I wasn't sure what was so bothersome about it. But even though I love the spiral jetty of Smith, Robert Smith, I also found it extremely repellent. And I had to really investigate what I didn't like about it. The form is gorgeous. It's like a a fern, a beautiful spiral, but it's very macho. It's moving tons and tons of rocks It feels incredibly more about the man trying to make an imprint on the land and less about the land trying to talk to the viewer. And so I think that was what my problem with these land art pieces were mostly very male gestures, making the land reflect their ideas. And I didn't want to be part of that Mm. system. I didn't want to impose myself on the land. But I wanted the land to speak through me. You've explained quite a bit your artistic approach. Could you tell us a bit more about the themes, the inspirations you explore in your art? I guess breaking with the idea that you made something that was just in that moment, that would sit on a pedestal and be there It took a while for me to break away from the object. A lot of my early work was celebrating natural forms. I made sculptures that looked like frogs' eggs and seed pods and burrs. And actually, a very funny thing happened in my studio. I had a studio in Philadelphia, and I had a big hound dog, and he was named after the river Schuylkill in Philadelphia. And Schuylkill, I would take him to my studio because otherwise he'd be lonesome. And one day when I had been making a whole lot of these kind of burr-like forms and they were drying on a low rack, 
he walked past them and they caught in his fur. And at first I was really upset because all of my work was going to drop on the floor, but some of them stuck to his fur. And I realized that's what my work needs to be about. It needs to be about the action and how things work in nature and not about just standing there in a static way, imitating nature. I've watched a few conferences that you gave and you seem to value a lot that your art takes a lot of people to make. It takes a village, you said at a point. Why is engaging communities important to you? It's funny because originally I thought it was sort of absurd that these pieces took so many people. But over time, I started to see that that really was kind of the best part of the art was involving a lot of people and getting to experience where you were and to talk about the natural processes that were going on on the site and having everyone join in and learn and explore with you. So it was very thrilling to have this kind of community of makers. I think I had never really liked being alone in my studio. I'm not really made for long hours of silence and, and just working with myself, but For so long, that's how art was presented to me, that you went up into your garret and, and you worked by yourself and it was lonely. And then you'd come and bring your work out after weeks and weeks and take it directly to a museum and hang it on the wall. That was kind of like the scenario of being an artist. And it's been incredibly liberating to realize that you can make art with a lot of people, even though it's not art by committee, which is something you sort of have to beware of. It's art with many, many makers, and it really enlivens the process. And I think it gets the idea deeper into the soul of everyone else when they've had a hand in making it. And they have a much deeper understanding of the project, what kind of processes you're talking about, the ecology behind what you're making work about, and also just the complexity of making these things. They seem sort of minimalist and simple, when you see them in, in the gallery or out in nature, but it took a lot of different skills and components to get them into that form that makes them look maybe not effortless, but certainly they never reflect the kind of work that actually went into it. It's also interesting that I found that I wanted to work with a lot of different disciplines. I just never knew enough about the subject and I always had to find out more. So I went to experts. Say I was working on who was living in the water in a lake in Seattle. And I could look at books and I certainly have a wonderful natural history library, but I really wanted to find out from the people who knew exactly what was swimming and, and crawling in the water and the soil. I wanted to talk to them about the project. And so I really started to work with a lot of different professionals on these projects to make them happen and also to make them function, which in for some of the projects is a really important part of their aesthetic is that they're actually functional too. Is it through the experts that you met in other fields like engineers, scientists, water specialists that you realized about climate change? My awareness of climate change, which now I'm aware of as climate crisis, came very early on for me. I had a science teacher in elementary school. So when I was about oh, 10 years old, our science teacher would sit us down and we would be discussing the, the world and talking about how it was going to heat up and the ice caps were going to melt and most of Philadelphia would be underwater. And I remember sitting there in a childlike way thinking, does that mean my home will be flooded? So I, I remember us all asking, what about my home? And the science, just science teacher would ask, now, where do you live? And depending on where you lived in Philadelphia, if you were on the coastal plain or high up on the escarpment, meant the difference between your house being flooded and you actually being high and dry. So I remember that quite acutely. When I was in college, and so I was uh, spending a lot of time in the forestry school at Yale, climate change was very much talked about, but everyone talked about it in a very circumspect, almost hushed way. Like you could be accused of being mm -hmm. a crazy person if you, if you were really into climate change. And it's so okay. um, terrifying to me to think that something so important could be kept under wraps now because of our terrible politics. 
particularly in America. But it was kept under wraps scientifically because it was not considered scientifically sophisticated to embrace climate change during the um, Mm -hmm. 80s. And so my awareness came mostly through flooding. A lot of times we think about climate crisis and we think the oceans are rising, which indeed they will be doing. But the oceans rising affects a very particular part of the landscape. And we don't think about all the other terrible effects it's going to have. And one of the effects that I was starting to notice in the 90s was when it rained, there was so much more flooding. And that wasn't actually completely carbon-based climate issue. That was because we had covered most of the world, the suburban world and half the forest with impermeable mm. surfaces like parking oh. lots and roofs and lawn too. Our, our yeah. turf lawns absorb 10% of the water, something just absolutely pathetic. Lawns really should be pink and not green so that no one should ever think that the lawn is a natural place. So I was noticing through my work in forestry that the streams were flooding all the time. A a small rainstorm would result in a lot of uh, local flooding. And that was kind of an alert that something had changed. And I I kept thinking, oh, it's because of everything's very covered in these impermeable materials that don't allow the rain to soak in, which is indeed a great problem. But also I noticed we were getting more Mm -hmm. and more rain. And that's really how climate crisis is striking places that aren't at first dealing with ocean tides or urban river tides, but are dealing with this other kind of tide, which I'm calling the slow tide, which is the rising and lowering of creeks and rivers that are being flooded because there's so much more rain. The frequency of rainstorms is higher, and also the amount of rain that falls out of the sky is much more intense than it ever was. And that's going to be our biggest problem in a lot of places. It turns out that the white settlers were having a terrible time with flooding about 20 years after they settled certain uh, areas. And there were a lot of historic notes in places that they're complaining about the terrible flooding that they're suffering which I found very interesting because this, I mean, Australia is very young and America is is almost as young, but just a tad older. And people in, in like 1750 and 1760 are mentioning how often the areas are flooding. And when we think back on those those early times of the white settlers, we don't think about urbanization. But basically, they had changed the landscape first by killing all the beavers who were um, doing a lot of water control here. The American beaver is a real engineer of our watersheds, but they also make very fine Mm. top hats. And they were sending just tens of thousands of pelts to London after they killed them. So there were no more beavers that were engineering the watershed. And then white settlers were cutting all the trees down so that there wasn't the forest cover that the land needs in order to absorb the rain. So this problem of impervious surfaces or the wrong surface has a very long history in these colonized areas like America and probably in Australia too. I'd be interested to find out about that. Definitely. Uh, At the moment, a lot of thoughts are around how First Nations people used to manage their water, their land, and go back to take inspiration from those uh, practices to mitigate uh, the current risks. So a a lot of your work explores the themes of water. You said that you are looking at integrating art into sustainable rainwater management practices. Could you tell us more about that and how you proceed and maybe how you work with specialists or water specialists? Well, the rain is something that we kind of seem to use or consider it like a, a toxic material. If you're an engineer, the thing you're most trying to do if you're a civil engineer is get the water from near the buildings away. Just get it away from the site and preferably send it directly to a stream somewhere. So this sense of getting rid of rain is a very pervasive engineering desire. And it comes down to how we build everything is to keep everything dry. And I kept looking at this and thinking, God, the rain is such a precious resource. As well, you know, with the droughts that your country has suffered and and my country too, but we don't treat it right. And so part of 
what I wanted to do is celebrate the rain. I knew that art could have a hand in making us see the rain as something to celebrate and love. And if you think about when you're little, how when it rains and you play in the gutters and you play in puddles and you really interact with the rain, that interaction gets lost as you get older and you start to think, oh, it's raining, what a drag, I'll have to do this or I, I won't be able to do that. The rain becomes something you sort of don't like. And I wanted to bring this idea that the rain is a wonderful thing and we should celebrate it and give it some, you know, some sort of a pleasant thought instead of thinking that there's something toxic. And we should also try to reserve mm -hmm. it so that it could be used later. Part of the problem with rain is it comes, there's sort of too much of it that comes. But it's like people go shopping all the time for, you know, a week's worth of food and they know how to store their food so it doesn't go bad and they can use it across the week. We need to be thinking about our rain like the way we think about our groceries or anything. Or, mm -hmm. you know, people put valuable things in a vault and hold on to them. We should think about the rain being incredibly precious and we need to hold on to it in a more effective way. So that was very influential to me. But also I was working with landscape architects who were trying to preserve areas that were being going to be turned into retention basins that would hold the rain in these terrible kind of lawn or turf-like pools and trying to make a better solution. And because when I was a forester, I was often working with landscape architects who were working on ways of dealing with rain. It rubbed off on me and it became a sort of mission for me to try and bridge that gap that we have between the beauty of wetness and rain and the value of the water itself and to try and make that something that people could understand and celebrate also. In the conference you gave at uh, Swarthmore College, you were admitting that while you call yourself an environment artist or eco-artist, you were not necessarily uh, walking the walk because of the nature of the work you're doing. International exhibitions, travels, all sorts of things that are coming with the fact to be an artist and an international artist. And I was curious to know how you're dealing with this uh, contradiction. And is there things you do and that, or that you advocate in the art industry to decrease your carbon footprint? It's a very difficult conundrum for me. And I've long been in the conundrum of, could I just take my energy and do something, my personal energy, and do something more effective with it? That was always the call of being a lawyer. It, instead of an artist. And the same thing now has morphed into my worry about what it takes to be an active building artist who I need to work in lots of different places. And so I need to get to those places. And that is problematic in terms of how much of a carbon footprint that you make. But at the same time, I do feel that the story of nature, like all the different parts of the story of rain or the story of birds and the story of habitat are all stories that do not get told enough. And people have no ecological literacy. And so they're not going to get it simply from a television or a computer screen. They really need to get it this literacy by living it in their daily lives, by seeing things change when they wait for the bus or when they get in and out of their own cars in the parking lot or they, when they look out of the window from their building and, and see the, the gutters in action when it's raining. So I feel like it's very important to affect the actual places where people spend time. And I don't know how to do that except by going to those places. And so it is a conundrum that isn't exactly solved. But I also see that if I don't do it, then many people don't get an understanding of nature, don't get ways to celebrate what's going on. And so the problem deepens in a sort of a more psychological way, too. So I guess I have to weigh one yes. against the other. Though I try, when in my personal life, I try to have a smaller print, except when I need to travel for work. 
At the moment, we are kind of bombarded with very pessimistic messages regarding the global warming and the acceleration of it. Do you think the arts can help influence our capacity to imagine new futures with a successful climate mitigation? I'm a very practical person, and I like the idea of being able to figure out a solution. There are many days that I feel that there are not that many solutions, but I never think that you should give up trying to solve something until your last breath. And so I feel that we can learn to make changes in how we live. It will not stop climate crisis, but it will help mitigate it over time. And as we live, we're going to have to change how we live with the world. And so what I've been concentrating on is how we live with rain and how we're going to have to give rain more space. I talk a lot about giving a home to the rain. And by creating these places where rain can be in lots of little places, I'm hoping that that can have small amounts of solutions that can kind of add up to a greater solution. That's on my hopeful days. I'm not always hopeful, but I think that our only hope is to try and change our perception of how things should be. We have lived with this idea that humans come first. We never quite see our interconnectivity to the rest of nature. We love nature, but we treat it terribly. And I keep thinking that if we just change our perception a little bit, if everyone changes a little bit, that there is some hope there. And I think that art is one of the greater ways of changing perception than almost any other way. It's subtle, but it gets into your system and you start to change how you see the world through these different ways of, of seeing things through art. So I do believe that art has a role, but I also know that it's only when people see like their own candles or slumping in their house when they realize, mm. wow, that must be a really hot day. Yes. I think people need to see a kind of reality come right up to their doorstep. And art can kind of make a sort of mm -hmm. um, make that action kind of happen in their backyard in a certain way that very little else can. Seeing pictures of the glaciers melting isn't stirring people up, but maybe having an understanding that their house will be underwater in a flood if we keep letting the water pour off of our parking lots, maybe they will sort of get that because it's working more in their backyards. You know, seeing the candles mm -hmm. in, on your dining room table slumping that convinces you. So I guess I'm the candle slumper in a certain way. I'm trying to give these visions of reality to people. We've seen recently some Extension Rebellion activists at the National Portrait Gallery in London protesting against links that the gallery had with BP. Do you think the art industry need to do its uh, self-critique and stop accepting sponsorships from destructive businesses? That is such a thorny question and a wonderful question because I don't show in galleries very much. I sort of feel like I can say things like, well, yes, I certainly think that all of those corporations ought to be kicked out of the museums. But basically, the museums close or have to charge a great deal of money to get for people to come in. If there aren't those corporations, and though they bring glory upon themselves saying how altruistic they are, I always feel that art is going to have a really hard time surviving if there aren't institutions that are giving artists a place to have their voice be heard and bringing audiences in. But at the same time, I have never liked that system, the way traditional art is set up to take money from corporations, all sorts of corporations. Remember, we all started with tobacco. Big Tobacco was the original art supporter. Mm. And then it went yeah. to pharmaceuticals Absolutely. and to and to petrochemicals. So art has always been, uh, we've been sluts to, to big business uh, our whole lives, but we've always been the hand that bites the uh, feeder too. And I think that's been an interesting place for art to be. But in all that, I have tried to work outside of that art museum system. So much of my money comes from 
more, I work a lot with taxpayer money because I do public art that gets commissions that are paid for by tax dollars and also by the construction budgets. They get a, a portion of construction budgets. So I, in some ways, I haven't had the luxury of being given grand shows and wonderful museums that are supported by terrible corporations. But it's very hard as an artist to say no to money on the table when you're trying to make art. Mm -hmm. And I think that all of us are uh, very, very conflicted by that. We would love to say no, but our hearts want the art to be made. And so it makes us sort of, in a certain way, a lot of times artists will just work for anybody. But I love when the donor is shown to be what they are. I think that's a really important thing that all the Sackler galleries in um, the Smithsonian Museum and down in Washington are all being exposed as really scary pharmaceutical companies that felt no responsibility for people and then got to glorify themselves with this sort of cultural bouquet of being a donor to a museum. So I'm very glad that this is being exposed. I think in a better world, art would not be supported by corporations. And I've tried to step out of that. But it's very, very difficult as an art maker to not have corporate funding on your side. On another topic, Go Simon explores the links between feminism and the environment and how both are intertwined. And I was wondering if in your artist journey, you had experienced sexism and if you ever felt that it was a barrier to the promotion of your art. Certainly, I went to art school at a time where the art schools were 50%, sometimes 70% women. And then you would go to the galleries and there was hardly a woman being shown. So I knew that we were getting the short end of the stick as females. And I also see how men talk about their work. They have so much hubris about how great their work is. And I've never, even though I'm a rather bold person, I've never felt like I could go out and crow about my work like these young roosters do. I never could, <laughs> could tell people that they deserve to give me all the money in the world so I can make whatever I want to make. I just don't have that chemistry in me. And I really think that's been problematic. I think that men stride into the art world with such confidence and women that we are confident in our work. We have this moment of kind of questioning ourselves. But I find that questioning so valuable. I hate that it's kind of crushed and it makes us not as successful because I think you have to be a questioning person to be a good artist. You shouldn't just stride out and think that everything you think, every burp and fart is a brilliant moment, you should really be going over what you're thinking and, and, and editing it. And I think that the act of questioning and not being so cocksure of yourself are really important traits for artists, but they get squashed in the system. So there's a lot of overt mm. sexism, and then there's a kind of internalized sexism too, I do notice that all the land artists were males for the most part. I mean, Nancy Holt was there and a few others, but it was a very male world. But people in the environmental or eco artist realm are about 80% women. So we have definitely taken over mm -hmm. that field or, or just we find ourselves because we're natural repairers. We want to repair things and make better connections between things. I think that that's a very valuable trait that's been undervalued in the commercial art world. And so we found ourselves being able to carry it out in more of the eco art world. One of the, the funny thing is, yeah. is that comparison of Smithson Spiral Jetty. Finally, after years of looking at it and wondering about it. And anytime something was written about me, there was always a picture of Smithson Spiral Jetty there to give context to my work. And I kept thinking, I have nothing to do with this man. Though I do admire that. And I know that it was a very groundbreaking at the time to step out of the gallery and very brave. But I really felt that I had to remake that work because the spiral jetty is the Mona Lisa of land art. It's what everyone knows if they know one piece of art that's about environmental mm. art, it will be the spiral jetty. And so I felt it needed to be remade. Mm. So I did get a chance to remake it. 
But this time, instead of being a rigid, giant, earth-moving piece, it was a fluid, floating, growing wetland that was out on a lake. It was only a third of the size of the actual spiral jetty. And it was called Spiral Wetland. But there it was, the same lovely, spiral, natural, fern-like shape of Smithson Spiral Jetty. But it was floating. It made incredible habitat for birds. And it was very flexible, so it could blow in the wind and have choppy water underneath it, and it would just float over that. And it made great habitat for fish underneath. So it was very important for me to feminize that piece and make it more inclusive for nature instead of a statement. On a personal level, you were mentioning that while you were not recognizing yourself in a rooster overconfident type of attitude you still needed to be out there and just show your art what did you do to actually gain confidence did it come progressively did you work on it i think a lot of it i must have been born with a fairly strong quotient of boldness because i do have this kind of sense that if it needs to be made i can go out and make it So I have this kind of mission feeling that goes on in me that I rarely stop. If I think that there's something I see in my head that I really, really want to get out in the world, I will really try hard to make that happen. And that the project itself gives me a kind of boldness. I become like the stage mother for the project. And so even if I'm not feeling all that much strength to compete and to sort of open doors for myself, I can open them for the project that I'm nurturing and looking after. So I think that sort of reframing that my art is something I'm working for has been very helpful for how I can muster my courage in order to go out and ask for mm -hmm. funding, ask for people to help me and ask for people to give me permits so that I can do things in rivers and in, on land. You were mentioning that in the arts sector, women represent basically the majority of the audience and the majority of the participants, but that at the highest level, it's still very much a boys club with a very, very low proportion of female artistic leadership. What do you think we can do to influence and fix this? I think that's sort of highly tied up in the funding issue of like, if evil companies with bad aims in their futures are supporting the arts, maybe we need to step out of that system to the best that we can and work outside of the system mm -hmm. and not be so encumbered by this feeling that we need to have a show at a fancy gallery or that our success won't be complete until we, we have a show at the, a retrospective at some particular museum. Maybe to just give up on all that old window dressing of what it is to be an artist and to rethink what the really important part of being an artist is, is something we need to do so that we can take off those old clothes and not be encumbered by them and go in new directions that are deeply satisfying, and, but just not to seek the satisfaction from the status quo and the old way of doing things. And those kind of changes, they take a long time. But if you think about it, A woman mm. used to feel good about herself, used to feel her value by who she married or how clean her kitchen was or how well her shoes matched her pocketbook, her purse and her hat. And if you think about that, those are very bygone, lost things, happily lost. We don't value ourselves because our Our wood floors are sparkling and our carpets smell fresh. We value ourselves for many, many other reasons in this modern era. So I do believe that we can value ourselves as artists without the same shiny kitchen, which would be a show at the you know, Metropolitan and the Museum of Modern Art. You can have an art career without prancing around in the, in the great art venues. You can actually do it outside of the traditional places. And I think it's important to maybe put our energy towards doing that and to sort of ignore the old mm. state art world, which is somewhat polluted by the people who give it money. I do love the idea of 
making art happen somehow. And a lot of the funding for what I do is from uh, what's called what we call in America, 1% for the arts. So 1% of a construction budget of any federal building needs to go towards art. I can tell you that it turns out to be about a quarter percent because the, the three quarter percent is to administer the damn grants, but they still, that forces a building to have an artistic component to it every time a new building is built. And in some ways that sounds a little um, handed, but in other ways it makes things happen. That's why airports in America, and I don't know if this is true in Australia, because I've unfortunately never been to Australia, though I've always wanted to go. Our airports have a lot of art in them for the most part, because as they've been added to, they've been forced to have an artistic component, a piece of art or something going on that has to do with art in the airport. And it has made the airports much more pleasant and livable and exciting places to be. So I think one of the legal changes is trying to fund art wherever something's being built. So that's a start. And then we have here the lead challenge, which is your building does certain things to make it more environmentally friendly. It's a checklist and that you can go from bronze to silver to gold to platinum, depending on how many things you check off your list. But there's also a newer thing that's much more intense called the living building challenge. And with that challenge, you treat the building like an organism and everything that is coming into the building has to be processed on site by the building and the landscape that surrounds it. And they have many, many demands. And one of them, they're called petals that you're talking about. So energy conservation, how you're dealing with water, those are two different petals. But there's also a petal called beauty. And the idea that a building to be truly functional needs to have beauty incorporated in it is a really important Mm. new idea, or maybe not so new, but it fell out of favor for a while. And this idea that beauty too Mm -hmm. is sustainable is really, really important. And I actually did do a piece in the last couple of years in Pittsburgh on a living building challenge. And I was brought in because I could cover two of the petals. I was dealing with the water because I was taking rainwater from the roof and and carrying it around the building to the wetlands. But I also was dealing with the beauty petal because I was adding a place of spiritual uplift and something intriguing for your eyes. And so it was interesting to me that I could, as an artist, I could fulfill the assignment of a building. And I think that is something that we might need to look into, how to get art into more places by sort of forcing the hand of the builders to make sure that it's included. Mm. But the idea that maybe there Mm. aren't like mausoleums for art and that art's just happening everywhere in the future, to me, that's kind of a nice thing. I wanted to get your reactions on two articles recently published in the press. The first one was an article by The Verge called 2020 election, climate change becomes a bigger priority, question mark. I was curious to know your thoughts on America's current political mood on climate change and also on the coming elections. It's such a difficult and dreary subject, unfortunately, which makes me just all of us with any brains in America are wake up every morning and we can't believe that Agent Orange is our president and that he every week he does something awful. As I was collecting water in streams around Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, he's writing, destroying the Stream Protection Act that has been part of our very vague and not always so effective a natural protection to the natural world since Nixon, who was a terrible man, but actually was quite the environmentalist compared to other Republicans. So I can't express to you how terrifying it is to live in a world that you thought was a democracy and is turning out to be some kind of horrible nightmare of bully running the entire country and everyone being scared. So I'm hoping that things will change. But our greatest dread is that we're going to have another four years of that and another four years crazy person. I mean, a truly insane person 
running a giant country and tearing everything we love and value down. You even start to wonder if you'll be arrested because you're voting for Bernie Sanders. But stranger things have happened and Mm. it only gets stranger in America. Most people are going to feel more and more unsafe. And I think that we already have an unsafe feeling coming on us because of climate crisis. And I have to say it is this Mm. year, the first time people like farmers who were longtime deniers of climate crisis and just ordinary people have actually started to seem worried about how nature is going to be ruined by what we do to it. And so it really, I mean, it really has been the last year that this awareness has gone through the country. So I guess I'm sort of cheered by that. I'm I'm sort of given a little bit of hope that maybe people will realize that things need to change, but they have to sort of hunker down and protect only themselves. And that is the no, dark yeah. side of worry is when you go from a sense of generous worry to a sense of self-protection. And I feel like America can just get totally into self-protection and people will start buying up water and as they already are in many ways. And farmers will just say, Mm -hmm. I'm just getting the goddamn last crop that I can out of this field. And I'm going to cut and run with as much money and profit as I can get. So I worry that it may spawn an almost destructive side to things. But when Mm -hmm. I feel hopeful, I think that maybe it will change. Maybe farmers will realize that they have a role to play, not to deny climate change, but to sequester carbon in their soils. They're perfectly set up for that. I hope that people who, who make things will start to realize that what they make, they have to think about a little bit more. They have to be more responsible. I long for a time of common sense. I'm not sure it ever really existed. I think historically, we always look back and and think that we were much more wonderful than we really were. America has been a terrifying place for people of color for as long as it's existed. From slavery to Jim Crow, this Mm. country has been horrifying in how it's treated African-Americans. And that history has been so covered up. We always think about how great everything was back around the depression when people knew how to survive on very little. But there was a great deal of cruelty in that period too. And I worry about a coming cruelty and a coming selfishness where everyone looks after themselves in a time where it's hard to survive. But I hope that's not going to be the case and there's going to be more pulling together and politically, you know, the next step is if if Trump has to, and I hate to mention his name because I wouldn't even give him that honor, but (laughs) if that madman wins again, I'm just really not sure what we're going to do. Everyone, you know, talked the first time around about Mm. moving to Canada, but that's not going to help anything. But I really don't know what we're going to do. And it's so climate change is definitely getting into the dialogue, into the political dialogue. But people will say one thing, but will they really vote for it in the end? Will they vote for bills that change Mm. it? Will they sacrifice themselves? So I never put too much credence in political change. I want to see the laws change and to see people living with that change and sacrificing in order to have a better chance for the future. I think we're all terrible sacrificers, not good at sacrificing for the future. And right now, that's what it's boiling down. That notion of sacrifice is not really something that you hear politically, because obviously people would not probably vote for someone saying, well, actually, we'll need to sit on some of our comfortable life to be able to sustain our presence on this planet. You will need to drive less and buy differently and fly less. So this is not very appealing, I'm afraid, politically. There have been times when sacrifice meant something. Certainly during wars, when people were asked Mm. to sacrifice and to send tin foil to the war effort and not to eat butter or sugar because that was being sent to the troops. I always feel like if we could get back to the sense that we could sacrifice for a a mission, then maybe it would work. But I don't know how to make nature be the thing we sacrifice for. Mm. So I guess my step is trying to teach people how to live 
better with nature and to share more with nature. So instead of framing it as a mm. sacrifice mm. to say the the sort of the joy of sharing instead of the sadness of, of sacrificing and losing something. But I don't know if it's true in yes, Australia, yes. but they spend an awful lot of time in elementary school and when you're in a small child in school, you're constantly being told how important it is to share. Sharing what you have is is That's so important. True. You That's should true. never have everything, yeah. but you should always always split it with everyone who's there. And then we get out of school and the first thing we do is we try and take the lion's share ourselves. And I keep thinking if we could just keep yeah. that sharing yeah. attitude going and we shared with nature, it would certainly be the first steps to helping it recover in the way that we want it to recover. Nature will, will recover on its own. We just won't, we will be long dead, but it would help nature and how we live with nature right now. If we could share more with yeah. it, if we could give more space to it and not give it poisonous chemicals. And if we could stop cutting it down and if we could stop drilling it, if there were ways of, sharing and simply letting nature be things would be a lot better and it's that always the first step is to think of yourself as going out there and sharing yourself and sharing your assets with nature don't mow three acres of lawn or hectares of lawn go out there and, and yes. make sure your your the outside of your house is a place for birds and for caterpillars and stop living in it like that you get it all and that nature gets only a few crumbs. Be more equitable outside. And the second article I shared with you was about Extinction Rebellion. It was called uh, Extinction Rebellion Terror Threat is a wake-up call for how the state treats environmental activism. It was published in The Conversation. And again, I wanted to know what were your views on movements like this. Extinction Rebellion is well known to use uh, art as well as a mode of expression. It's very much into their visual identity, for example. And I'm thinking about the Red Rebel Brigade in particular that we've seen around very much uh, in Spy from Margaret Atwood book, The End's Main Tale. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think environmental activism is absolutely the first line of defense that needs to go on. I'm a great admirer of it. I am not made to be an activist myself. I think some people, it suits some people to go out on the front lines and other people have a kind of work behind the scenes quality. And I am definitely a work behind the scenes person. But when I see this kind of activism, especially when it's turned into these visual moments, like the red blood-like um, liquid sprayed all over buildings, I think it's so powerful and meaningful. But the idea that it's dangerous is, is horrifying, though in this day and age, everything is becoming dangerous. We wonder mm -hmm. about if, if you're going to get arrested for voting for the wrong person. I think we've all retracted how we state how we feel because we can be chased around by social media in, in terrible and threatening ways by trolls. I worry about even the simple act of having a bumper sticker on my car because I think someone will look at oh, that wow. and like what I say and will slash my tires or run me off the road. So I think there's this feeling of fear that's percolating up partially from all these bullies who are now dictators in America and the Philippines, people who have made the world feel unsafe unless you're going to fight. And I'm simply not a fighter. I'm Quaker by tradition. I'm, I'm not going to be out there defending myself in a violent way. And so I, I feel very cowed by this idea that if you make a statement, it could get you in a lot of trouble. And I really, I mean, I definitely, this is the beginning of the ends of democracy. If, when protesters are turned into yes. villains, that is mm -hmm. where things start to erode. And certainly the Third Reich was very good on making any people who were protesting about labor laws turned into prisoners very quickly. So I think that's one of the scariest things. The idea of turning particularly an environmental activist into a criminal is very scary. But 
we are very much in these scary times where you wonder if when you vote a way that people don't want you to vote, whether they're going to toss you in jail too, if that's going to be in our future. I'm not really sure. To conclude, would you have a book, a film, something that inspired you lately that you would like to recommend to our listeners? Yes, yes, I do. There's a new book out called Nature's Best Hope. And it's by a lovely and very thoughtful author named Douglas Ptolemy. And I, I feel very kindred with him because he's one of these people who feels that if everyone did a little bit to share nature, to share their backyard with nature, that we would we would slowly get ahead of the destruction, or at least keep up with it, of our environment. And it's very much about how everyone can do something. But it's not the typical greenwashing that you hear about so much, like, oh, if you recycle your thing, or if you use less paper, or turn the faucet off when you brush your teeth, all of these things that don't actually make differences. He's not about that at all. Doug Talame is about how you treat your backyard and how you plant different things in order to try and help bird species return and because you're sharing your yard with other species, other species of caterpillar and insects, and then the birds are attracted and, and can be sustained by the, say, the caterpillars that this oak tree that you left in your yard instead of cutting it down and putting some horrible weeping cherry in there instead... If you can make your backyard more natural and more filled with native varieties of trees and shrubs, that you can actually help support diminishing bird populations. So I'm very heartened by this book. And there are nights when it feels like it's the only thing that has some hope in it. So I, I've been reading it before I go to bed. And the movie Woman at War, and it's about a, it's an Icelandic film. It's a wonderful film. And she's a... She's an extraordinary character that uh, is highly admirable and, and a real eco-fighter. Excellent. Thank you very much for these recommendations. And thank you, Stacy, for your time, your words, your art, and accepting to tell us more about your journey as an eco-artist. Thank you. Thanks for listening. To find out more about Stacy Levy's work, check out her website, stacylevy.com. All the references mentioned in this episode are also listed on the podcast website, gosimon.org. If you like this episode, it would be so appreciated if you could leave us some starts on podcast platforms or share our work with your friends and family. It tremendously helps amplifying our amazing Simone's voices. Thank you and see you in two weeks.